Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to discuss with you patient prosthesis mismatch and re review some of the literature in relation to clinical practice. I apologize if some of you have attended some of this talk during a lunch, uh, lunch box session. I'd like to start by presenting a case of a 67-year-old lady with diagnosis of aortic stenosis. Her transthoracic echo gradient was 86 millimeter. Echocardiographic measurement of the annulus was around 19 millimeter. Her body surface area was 1.6, which gives you an index of about 0.75. I'd like to have a look at these choices of valves and operations, and then I'd like to have a vote and a show of hands as what you would like to do. Who would choose to put a 19 millimeter stented valve on this patient? Thank you. 19 millimeter mechanical valve. I'm combining options three and four. Who would choose a root enlargement placing a large stented valve, 23 millimeter, and a sub, uh, coronary stentless valve. An aortic root replacement with a large annulus. All right. Probably some of the thought processes going through your mind include that a 19 millimeter uh, tissue valve for this patient is fine, or for most patients of her characteristics. But others probably think that a 19 millimeter is associated with reduced short and long-term survival. And some of you probably think that a stentless valve and root enlargement provide better long-term uh, outcome for this patient. In the next few slides, I'd like to discuss with you some of the literature in patient prosthesis mismatch and the evidence for and against the decisions made for the patient that we just described. You heard the definition of mismatch. It is when the geometric dimension of the prosthesis in vitro, or it's a geometric dimension, and it's not a functional assessment of the valve. But these geometric dimensions vary widely with different manufacturers. Some of the manufacturers measure an internal orifice, some measure an external orifice, and some measure the stent. As you can see, if you have a 21 millimeter valve on the shelf in your operating theater, for an EPIC, it gives you an internal orifice of 21, for a classical Carpentier, 18.3, for a perimount, a 20 millimeter, and let's say a mitral flow, 17.3, and a mechanical, a smaller valve. So what is on the shelf as 21 millimeter, and it's labeled as 21, has vastly different internal orifice diameter. So what determines the transvalvular gradient? It's determined by the effective orifice area and transvalvular flow, which in turn is determined by the cardiac output and the body surface area. Therefore, it is best to index your effective orifice area, as you saw in the previous presentations. If your figure is bigger than 0.85, there is no or mild mismatch. If it is between 0.65 and 0.85, this is moderate. And if it's bigger than, uh, less than 0.65, it is severe. So if you put a 19 millimeter Carpentier Perimount valve, which has, let's say, an effective orifice area published by them as 1.2, in a patient with a body surface area of 1.5, you get mild mismatch. If you put it in a bigger patient, it gives you severe mismatch. <clears throat> Some of the difficulty in reviewing the literature in re relation to mismatch is that the design of the studies are very varied. There are very few prospective randomized studies looking at mismatch. A lot of the hemodynamic studies are performed within the first week of the operation, which is hardly the normal functional status of the patient. And some of those which are done later or even earlier, we're not sure whether they translate into clinical results. Some of the theoretical and real 
Negative effects of mismatch include prevention of regression of LV hypertrophy, it reduces recovery of the systolic function, reduces functional class, it can affect the valve durability, and is associated with higher operative mortality and late cardiac events. In the next few slides, I'd like to review with you some of literature on mismatch on short and long-term survival, only some of the landmark literature. <clears throat> One of these studies by, was by Dr. Rao, Dr. David and colleagues, where they looked at over 3,000 patients who underwent aortic valve replacement. Of the 3,000 patients, one-third of the patients had some degree of mismatch. The ratio was 0.9 and less. So they looked at the cohort of patients and analyzed survival. The square graph shows the larger valve, and the round graph, the smaller valve, which is 19 and 20 millimeter. There's a significant difference in survival. They followed them up to, I think, 16 years, and the median was eight. Similarly, patients who had a smaller valve had less freedom from valve-related complications. In a different study by Modi and colleagues from Mayo Clinic, they looked at 400 patients who underwent aortic valve replacement. Then they looked at the degree of mismatch. Some had no mismatch, some had moderate mismatch, and some had severe mismatch. Patients with severe mismatch did worse in terms of their survival. It's the dotted graph. And moderate a bit better. <laughs> then they looked at some of the sub-cohorts of their study. They looked at the patients with a 19 millimeter valve and a 21 millimeter valve. Patients with a 19 millimeter valve, those who had severe mismatch did worse. And similarly, in the subpopulation of patients with a 21 millimeter valve, the gray graph are those with severe mismatch and they did worse. <clears throat> so in summary from these studies and similar ones, patients with severe mismatch tend to have a higher mean gradients prior to the operation. They have a lower pre and post operative ejection fraction. We'll address this a bit later. And more of them received a smaller valve. However, others disagree that it can affect short and long-term survival. One of these papers is by Dr. Blackstone and colleagues, where they reviewed the results of nine centers and over 13,000 patients in North America. Patients with a patient prosthesis mismatch of 1.2 and less had no different short and long-term survival, only they had a higher operative mortality by 1 or 2 percent. So they thought that mismatch does not really affect short and long-term survival. In a smaller study, but fairly similar, Medallion and colleagues looked at about 900 patients. They were equally divided to mechanical tissue and homograph. These are ongoing series. None of them are randomized. <clears throat> they looked at survival of these patients. And again, it was not determined by mismatch. However, a factor which determined their outcome was a lower ejection fraction. As for the lower ejection fraction, many of you may have seen this study by Dr. Blaise, Dr. Pibarro, and colleagues from Quebec, where they've done a lot of work on mismatch. This paper was published in Circulation. They looked at 1,200 patients, and they were fairly equally divided into no mismatch, moderate mismatch, and severe mismatch. Then they further divided their cohort into those who had an ejection fraction of more than 40% and those less than 40%. And they showed that outcome in patients with a poor ventricle was worse. However, if you read this paper carefully, you'll be a bit surprised by the numbers. I said we started with about 1,200 patients. In this box, which is a moderate mismatch and lower ejection fraction, there are 22 patients. In this box, which is severe mismatch and low ejection fraction, there are only three patients. Nevertheless, there is evidence in the literature, along with this study, that poorer ventricular function is a determinant of poorer outcome. So 
Does mismatch actually translate into clinical effect and patients' well-being? Dr. Koch, Blackstone, and colleagues looked at about 1,200 patients, and they carried out a functional score at eight months follow-up. This functional score was a Duke assessment score, which included exercise capacity, functional recovery, etc. And they showed that actually there was no difference in patients who had mismatch. So it did not translate into clinical effect. Most of the studies on mismatch that you've looked at so far are at least 10 years old. What about some of the newer generation of valves? They aim to reduce the residual gradient and improve late durability of the valve. In a recent study by Dr. Suri and colleagues from Mayo Clinic, they looked at 300 patients, and this is a genuine randomized study. Some received an Edwards Magna, some Sorin Microflow, and some St. Jude Epic. Then they did hemodynamic studies at four days. Please note the criticism that I brought to your attention of doing early hemodynamic studies, but I think this is the best which could be done for the moment. And they thought, they showed that in patients less than 21 millimeter, the performance of these valves was very similar. So in the newer generation of valves, there is no difference in patients' outcome. Very few of you opted for root enlargement and root replacement when you have mismatch. Perhaps you were thinking of more active patients. The results of root enlargement and root replacement in the presence of mismatch are very varied. Some report a mortality of as high as 20%, and some report mortality of 3%. One of these groups is Dr. Peterson, Dr. Feindel, and Dr. David, where they reported a mortality of 3% in their root enlargement group. However, there are very few studies looking at mismatch in root enlargement. There are studies reporting root enlargement, but not addressing mismatch. One of, one of the studies is by Kulik and colleagues, where they looked at 712 patients. This is a retrospective ongoing analysis. One-third of the patients had root enlargement. The annuli were less than 21 millimeter. They showed that there was really no difference in either survival or freedom from congestive heart failure if the patient has had a root enlargement, a simple aortic valve replacement, or valve replacement and enlargement. So they showed no difference. <coughs> However, in this cohort, with the root enlargement, there was less gradient across the valve, there was less patient prosthesis mismatch, but again, no important change in long-term survival. <coughs> what about stentless valve and patient prosthesis mismatch? In a study of 400 patients, 68 of them underwent a freestyle stentless valve. This study, again, is from Canada, uh, from, uh, from Dr. Pibarro's group. They looked at 19 and 21 millimeter freestyle valve. I have to say the operative mortality was very high, 33% in 19 millimeter and 7% in 21 millimeter. The rate of patient prosthesis mismatch was high, 80%, and was severe in about 60% of that. And thus, five-year survival was 60% for 19 millimeter and 82 for 21 millimeter. In the randomized trial of stentless versus stentless, uh, stented valve by uh, Professor Pepper and colleagues, which was published in 2005, they showed that there was a greater decrease in peak aortic velocity with a stentless valve. The index effective orifice area improved. However, again, this did not translate into clinical outcome. We're keenly awaiting their five-year or six-year result to be published this year. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, in summary, I think patient prosthesis mismatch does exist in all patients following AVR, but is rarely severe. It should be avoided in patients who are very active or who have an impaired ventricular function. Currently, in the third newer generation of valves, it does not seem to be a problem. And apart from mismatch, we really have to pay attention to valve durability. <laughs>
I'm grateful for your attention.